Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar of Top 5 Ways to Originate New Business, presented by NAM and by Lenshore. So as throughout the webinar, as questions arise, as I'm sure they will, please go ahead and use the, Q, the questions chat. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session, and we will answer all of your questions. With that, I will turn it over to today's speaker, Jamie Gelso. Take it away, Jamie. Thank you, Rose, and thanks to everyone for joining us today as we discuss what we feel are probably the top five ways to help you originate new business and, in essence, grow your business. My name is Jamie Gilso, and I work with the folks in the eastern U.S., trying to close a few loans every month. A little bit about Lensure and our agenda today. Uh, we'll discuss a quick backdrop of Lensure. We'll talk about, again, what we feel are five key ways to help you grow your business and originate new business. We'll talk about some of the products we offer to help you support those efforts in going after said business. And lastly, as Rose said, we'll open up for some Q&A. We do have our credit officials on the phone, including our director of underwriting. About Lensure, we were founded in 2015. We're headquartered in San Diego, California. We also have regional operation centers in Rhode Island and Georgia. Uh, our management team has 20 or 30 plus years per person of experience in the non-QM sector. We currently lend in 42 states, and we are always growing. Uh, what we do really at Lensure, we are a non-QM lender, but we really focus on the A paper borrowers that you see every day that kind of live on the fringe of the agency guidelines. Uh, if you see here, our average FICO is just above 700. Our average LTV is about just under 70 LTV. It's about 65% purchase money every month, and the average loan size is over 450,000. So if you took that data set, you'd see that we've got pretty good credit folks, pretty good collateral, pretty good LTVs, and a healthy amount of uh, purchase and realtor relationships with our LOs. Um, generally, what we see on these folks are, again, strong borrowers, strong credit. There's usually some kind of rub on the income piece where we have some ways to maybe be creative and, and look at things differently than the traditional agency guidelines. What we don't do, of course, is any kind of agency FHA, VA, Govy, HARP, et cetera. We're a non-QM only lender. We feel what separates us from the competition in the non-QM space is our service. Uh, all of our pre-quals are performed by our own in-house underwriters up front, so you'll have some kind of uh, solid answer to move forward on your customer with. We'll usually have that to you within 24 hours based on the complexity of the loan. Uh, after that, if the deal is submitted, uh, we will usually have you a conditional approval out of underwriting within 48 to 72 hours, again, based on the complexity of the loan. Uh, we have very quick turn times on this on this business. Uh, every month, we get a healthy amount of agency fallout from some of our key broker partners. It's not uncommon for us every month to close an owner-occupied uh, transaction within eight days of receiving it, and an investor transaction sometimes less. So basically, you as fast as the trade laws would allow us to. We do make common sense exceptions. Somewhere around 40 to 50% of our business every month is some variety of exceptions to our guidelines. You'll see some uh, examples of that later on. If it makes sense in the old adage, if you'd lend your money on it, we, we'd probably like to see that deal. We have what we feel is an industry leading bank statement program for your self-employed borrowers. And we have a pretty aggressive approach in how we can look at rental income uh, to help with the investment properties. So let's dive into these five topics. The first one is, again, expanding the offerings for the borrowers you really see every day. I mean, there's no secret we're in a pretty healthy refi boom, and I'm, I'm glad everybody's making hay while the sun shines. Uh, as we know, as, as the nightly news says, go refi, you get more applications, and, and some of that stuff just doesn't qualify. Um, the reality is many of these, pay, these borrowers, as you know, are, are very strong, good collateral, um, there's just some quirk, and again, it's usually tied to income. The reality is only about a third of the brokers in the country currently do non-QM, so there's a nice opening there for some folks that want to grow their business uh, or, or, you know, find some new avenues that aren't maybe as crowded as the refi boom where every customer's, you know, shopping you for three basis points in rate. Um, and interestingly enough, again, this is very good paper. These are good borrowers. You'll see that even two years after the funding date, most of these loans perform very well. Some of the ways we can help you in the just missed category specifically. Um, higher debt ratios. So 
our common debt ratio, our standard debt ratios will go up to 50, uh, 50%. We can go to 55 case by case. We will allow mortgage delinquencies on some of our products. Non-worthable condos permitted. We, we take deals every month where it fell out of agency because they found out the last minute the condo complex was not warrantable. We just grabbed one this morning on a beautiful residence above a Ritz-Carlton in Florida. Uh, it's a non-warrantable condo that is not a condo tell. And as a result, we're doing 75 LTV purchase. Uh, we allow for multiple sources of income. So it's not uncommon for us to have a scenario where one borrower is W-2, the other borrower is self-imploded bank statements, and on top of that, we may have some asset depletion as well. We'll accept the transferred appraisal. We allow for seasoning as low as 36 months on your housing events. And we will go with higher loan amounts, and we'll touch on that as well. But our standard guidelines state up to $3 million, And again, we will go higher case by case. So as, as those refis come in and, and, or the, you know, the purchase money because rates are so low, um, you, you folks know as well as I do, as you get into the file sometimes, very strong borrowers, but there's one quirk. Might be the condo complex. Might be lack of uh, two-year self-employment. Those are the deals we can help you with every month. So let's move on to marketing to business owners, another somewhat niche sector to go after. Uh, many people in America are self-employed. It's a great thing. Many of you on this call are probably self-employed. It's a great thing. About a third of the country is. Here you'll see some of the common uh, you know, occupations, whether it's real estate agents, contractors, attorneys. Uh, we do a lot of creative doctor lending, I can tell you that. Um, it's not uncommon, again, for us to find doctors, attorneys, CPAs who bought out the practice they were working at. They might have been a W-2 employee at a, at a very successful practice and then bought that practice less than two years ago. We have various ways to still make that deal work. The nice thing about trying to find these borrowers is, in general, they want to be found and seen. I mean, they're in business. That's what they do. So they're on the net. They're online. They have trade groups. For example, if you wanted to go after the doctor business, there's some very specific doctor trade groups where they talk about helping doctors get financing. Um, so plenty of ways to go after this business. We can certainly help you with that if you talk to your account executives. Here's an example on how we help some, some self-employed borrowers. This was a very, and folks, just as we go forward, all the examples you'll see here today are post-COVID examples. So these are, these are real. This is, this is real stuff that we're closing recently. Uh, we had a borrower that was a W-2 employee for a consulting firm, very successful person, uh, 15 months ago went on his own and opened his own company, same line of field. Um, could only provide 12 months personal bank, or business bank statements for income. The business had not yet filed taxes, but on those 12 months of bank statements, there was very strong cash flow. We could make sense of it. It was consistent. Borrower had strong credit, as you see, strong FICO, and had good reserves. So, so why lend share for this? We closed the loan at ADL TV. So again, I'll just pause for a second. 15 months self-employed, so less than two years, and we closed the loan at ADL TV. Uh, to me, that's pretty strong. 20% cash down came from the sale of the current home. So again, a, a very solid borrower, already had a house, already had a clean mortgage rating, good equity. It was a good size purchase price, so everybody made a good commission on the L own realtor side. And again, they had good reserves. So again, the common exception there that we might make is the less than two years self-employed. It's got to make sense. They're in the same line of work. They may have bought out the current business, et cetera. Here's an example for a, more of a traditional bank statement deal, if you will. It was a 24-month business bank statement loan. We have a, a floating expense factor. We'll ask a few questions of the borrower up front and then apply a common sense expense factor. Much of our competition uses more of a blanket approach, if you will. So in this case, uh, competition used a 50% expense factor. We had a solid borrower, 15-year truck driver, good credit, good money down. Uh, the file stalled with our competition just before clear to close based on the DTI once they had all the numbers, and they were not allowed to waiver off of that 50% expense factor. So why lend share? Well, we liked the loan, so we dove into a bit. Uh, dove into it a bit. We, we asked some questions. We got an LOE from the borrower. The underwriter was then able to confirm that the borrower's gas um, and insurance, I believe, was paid for by the company. I mean, if you think of that for a second, a truck driver, their gas is probably one of their more uh, prolific expenses. We were able to take that out of the expense piece on the bank statement spread. Thus, 
reducing the expense factor, thus resulting in higher income, thus resulting in a lower DTI. It was a purchase LTV, a purchase transaction, ADLTV, deal closed. We came in at the last minute. Uh, again, I can tell you that RLO uh, made some pretty good inroads with that realtor and that realtor shop as a result of this. I'll touch a little bit more on the bank statement piece because um, that's about 40 to 50% of what we do every month. One thing that's nice about our bank statement program is we will give you a, a bank statement spread, as we call it, or analysis up front. You do not have to submit a full loan to us. You do not have to be an approved broker with us. If you have one of these deals and it's new to you or you're confused, uh, you know, bank statements can have a lot of moving parts. We're glad to help. You send us that deal, you send it to your account executive. Uh, they'll be glad to dive into it for you and give you an income number that you can use to then go forward and structure the rest of the loan around. Uh, we usually do that in a day or two for you, again, based on complexity of the file. Sometimes we get three different sets of bank statements. Um, so, P&L statements are not required. We'll go up to Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's internal webinar. I'm sorry, Rose, there must be some technical difficulties there. Um, the borrower does not have to be 100% owner of the business, which is nice. We will allow for multiple bank accounts to be accepted, which is not always the case. And lastly, I did mention the variable expense ratio. That's an important part because it, it, we see it every month save many deals. For example, you might have a work at home consultant or maybe a, a hairdresser where she just rents the chair in a salon. Those folks have maybe about a 15% expense ratio. It, it's very cut and dry. They, they, you know, that, that hairdresser, she pays a flat fee every month. So um, we, we see many deals every month where we, we save those loans because of that. So again, just real quick, we, we will allow multiple bank statements. Some of our competitors won't. Uh, we do not require a third party P&L or a CPA prepared P&L. We don't have a minimum, or we do have a minimum expense ratio, but it's 10%. Um, and I think just as importantly at the bottom, we will look at NSFs and overdrafts on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's tied to the industry. We've seen a couple restaurant and bar owners who work extremely long hours and late hours. And you might see a very standard pattern over 24 months of some of that activity, but it makes sense and, and you get the story why. So. Let's move on to marketing to property investors, another uh, very robust and growing market. Um, you may ask why. You know, it's no secret that uh, investment properties uh, in general programs are growing and, and there's a lot of people going after that business. Well, there's a few demographic stats here in terms of, you know, millennials and age and, and housing inventory and, and all these things are very accurate. Um, some of the younger folks nowadays prefer to live in the city or walk around. It's not easy to come up with a down payment in some markets. Some folks have student loan debt that prevents qualifications. But I think the bottom line is we can all agree that in general, um, folks buy their first house a little later in life than they used to. I won't tell you my age, but I can tell you when I grew up, you know, in your 20s, you're trying to buy your first house. I think nowadays that's been pushed back a bit. I think it's more of a late 20s or early to mid 30s event when people say, I want to buy my first house. Well, as a result of that, those folks have to live somewhere, so we tend to see them renting more. As a result, the property investor business has really grown, uh, and we have a lot of good products to help you go after that business. One thing that's nice about that segment is if you find the true professional property investors, the, the folks that really know the business, know their cap costs, know their leasing, all those things, they don't do just one or two or even three properties. They make a, they make a living out of it. They're constantly doing some kind of transaction, whether it's buy, flip, sell, renovate. Uh, and what that means is a steady stream of business for you probably for years to come. Not just for them, but also the realtors they're involved with. You know, you can, you can really open a, a cornucopia of good leads, if you will, uh, by doing business with some of these folks and their networks. So here's an example where we use some of our creating guidelines to, to help this investor. Sees an investor trying to buy another property. We had a, a, you know, a major competitor had the deal. It's actually more of a Fannie Freddie fallout where uh, rental property had a negative cash flow. And by the traditional Fannie underwriting methods, uh, the deal did not qualify. We, however, can use a different twist on that uh, when it comes to deducting the, um, the rental loss uh, or, or adding to expenses. 
uh, we, we flip it from Fannie. And the result of that is, while it sounds kind of small or minor, if you did the math on any given loan, you'll see that you end up with a much higher monthly income number by doing that. Of course, that results in more buying power, or, you know, and lower DTI. In this case, it helped save this deal. Um, we closed the loan very quickly. We didn't miss the original close of escrow by, met by many days. And of course, the LO is a hero uh, with the realtor again, you know, purchase business. Uh, I have to believe if this investor wants to buy more properties and continue to grow their portfolio, they'll probably use that same LO who in turn would probably use our AE. So nice, nice daisy chain of business going on there. When it comes to the documentation types and particularly uh, some of the things we spoke about, you'll see here on the left how we can um, use a different formula for the properties with a net rental loss. Um, we also, of course, do bank statements. And then lastly, we do a fair amount of the debt service coverage ratio, or what's known as the DSCR product. Just a quick overview of that. Um, because in many ways, this is a no income loan. If it's a business purpose loan, we're qualifying the deal in terms of income based off this ratio. So it would be no W-2s or 1040s um, or anything of that nature. This is your income piece right here for a DRCR loan. So basically, you take your gross rents from your leases or from the 1007, et cetera, and you divide that by your PITI, or in the case of a condo, your PITA. As long as that number is 1% or above, it meets our guidelines. Uh, again, if, if you are in the property investor game, it, it gets pretty easy for the right deals. This is your income right here. There's no, no Schedule E's. You know, there's no, no 1040s. This is it. Either the leases or the 1007 on the appraisal. Uh, we will make exceptions case by case to go below 1% on purchase deals with strong borrowers. So in summary, some other ways basically we can help you in this sector to go after this robust market is we, we don't have a cap on the number of properties that the borrower has financed. We see some borrowers, 30, 40, 50 properties. Many of them have mortgages. We ourselves will do 10 loans or up to 10 loans for any one investor. And we see that often going back to the slide about um, the relationship piece. It's not uncommon for us every month to take in what we would call a five pack or a six pack which is basically the same borrower, the same property investor, and five different properties. Um, it can become very efficient for our loan officer partners in that case, because again, there's not a lot of income documentation. It's, you know, change the 1003 on the addresses. Uh, DTI, DTI is up to 50%. We will do non workable condos uh, on investment properties. Um, rate buy-down features allowed. We have a very unique rate buy-down feature where somebody could finance the discount point into the loan and bring that rate down considerably for no out of cost expense. That of course results in a lower payment. And in these cases, a higher cash flow, which is something most property investors are really tuned into is the cash flow. We have aggressive DSCR loan programs. I mentioned that's basically a no ratio loan. Um, bank statements obviously for investment properties. And we will use interest only on investment properties as well as, well as the qualification piece. So as you probably all know, uh, on a standard owner-occupied loan, you cannot use the interest-only rate as your qualifying rate. Well, on a business purpose loan, you can. So if that is a true business purpose loan, meaning they're either buying an investment property for business purposes or refining an investment property with cash out for business purposes, uh, you can in turn use the interest-only payment to qualify them. So again, a better cash flow situation for your borrower, not only that, but we talked about the DSCR coverage ratio at 1%. Well, if you were just below it and you went to interest only, you were probably now just above it and therefore qualify. So let's move on to the foreign national market, another very burgeoning and robust market. You'll see some stats here, kind of backing up what I just said. About $80 billion a year, it's a, it's a pretty good chunk of change in annual volume. Uh, Almost 10% of those are for a million dollars or more. Um, it's actually, the, the foreign national buyer has a higher uh, median purchase price than the average US existing home sold. So pretty nice market to go after here, folks. Um, here you can see where the top five foreign national borrowers come from. I, I don't think any of this is a mystery to any of you. You know, China, Canada, India, the UK, Mexico. 
you know, a close second would be some other South American countries probably. Who, who is the foreign national? Who, who are these borrowers? Technically, a foreign national is a non-resident alien who's not authorized to live in the U.S. or really even work in the U.S. for any real amount of time. Um, basically, they are somebody that lives in another country, has their income in another country, and is a legal resident of another country. Um, based on that, they, of course, cannot purchase these properties as unoccupied because they cannot be here full time. So these properties are either in pure investment properties or oftentimes we'll see second homes depending on the market. For example, I'm in the Northeast, in case you couldn't tell by my accent. And in the Boston market, we have a, a, a large swath of uh, very nice colleges. You see a lot of Chinese borrowers come in. Uh, they send their kids to the Western school system and they then buy a condo for the child and the mother to live in while the child's in school. Uh, so uh, very, very strong market, very strong borrowers, and usually very nice loan sizes. Where can you find these folks? It's no secret that most of these folks are probably in the bigger cities of the U.S. You know, you'll see some things here like San Diego, New York. Uh, you know, you'll see stuff like, you know, CPAs in Miami, immigration lawyers in Chicago. The common theme is, though, it's, it's major cities and metroplexes. It's, it's, it's both coasts, it's Florida, it's Chicago. Um, you can look for those listings in different languages if you want. There are a couple of really good trade groups that support these efforts. Uh, NAREP on the Hispanic side and ARIA on the Asian side. I can tell you we work with both groups. Um, they are really, really strong referral sources. Um, if you know their business, and they feel comfortable and confident that you do know their business. I have to tell you, I've done a lot of this. It's a steady stream of business. Um, they they want to know what they have. They have people who cannot take these moves lightly. There's a lot of transfers of money. There might be a lot of international moving. So if they have confidence that you can close these loans, they will just keep feeding them to you. Here's an example of one we closed recently. This was a Chinese foreign national borrower. 70% purchase, of course, non-owner. We did get Chinese credit in the file. It was translated by a third party. 30% um, of the funds were gift, down payment. Again, we know this business. So we know that in China, there's a law that says you cannot take more than $50,000 per year out of the country. So we're very comfortable taking gift letters from relatives in China because of those laws. In this case, the reserves used to qualify were also in China. Uh, we closed this loan in about 15 business states. Again, I, I can't tell how happy the realtor was with the LO, our partner. So glad to help you with those connections. A few more highlights on our foreign and national piece. Um, again, we are very experienced in this business. Um, we, we do a, 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 just so much of it. Our number two AE last year in the company, this was really exclusively her business. Um, we have all of our account executives know the business and can walk you through the process. There's no domestic credit score required, up to 70 LTV. As you get into some countries, you don't have tax returns, we'll accept uh, income letters for verification. Uh, we'll accept, when there's no foreign credit report, we'll accept uh, bank references. Uh, keep in mind, as you get us these things, they'll have to be translated by a third party, and the um, currencies would have to be uh, converted to US dollars. But um, foreign assets can be used for reserves. And the reality, folks, is the borrowers that are doing this business, uh, and more importantly, the realtors that deal with them, they're very familiar with these things. It's not uncommon for, to ask them for these items um, in terms of translation and, and conversion of dollars. So that being said, we will now move on to the um, jumbo loan market. I know in talking to many brokers, I spoke to brokers pretty much daily, that there's been a quite a gap in the jumbo market since COVID. Uh, a lot of that liquidity dried up. We see it ourselves. We have more million dollar plus loans in our pipeline than I've seen in a long time. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of a couple that where we stepped up. Again, these are very recent approvals. We had a $2.9 million purchase of an investment property in the Hamptons. So that's a, that's a pretty big pretty big number for an investment property, but if you're familiar with the Hamptons, that's, that's pretty common. Our borrowers are father and son, long history of real estate investments. They're looking for max LTV. They could not provide, uh, provide income either traditionally or via bank statements, but, but strong, strong credit, 790 mid FICO on both, 
uh, just long stability of doing the right thing. So, so why us? Well, we closed a loan at, believe it or not, 75 LTV. I mean, that's both an exception to LTV and loan size, and, and a pretty hefty one at that. We were comfortable doing that because these borrowers, on top of the other things I just mentioned, had $12 million in assets post-close. We use those assets for asset depletion to qualify them on income. So this is one of those true deals where you might come across your desk. And again, the old adage, one of your first bosses may have taught you, would you lend your own money? When you got this deal over your desk, you're thinking, if I had $2 million, I'd lend it to these folks. I mean, credit, stability, $12 million in the bank post-close. So we found a way to make it work. We made a couple exceptions. Uh, we used asset depletion for income. And I got to tell you, uh, the loan officer on this deal is one of the highest producing LOs in the country. Very, very happy with us. Here's another one he just did that we really stepped out on. Uh, an, a, a very strong, unique borrower, founder of a technology company, uh, good credit, has a variety of income streams, uh, is literally a professor at a major university, has SSI, and has K1 from 10 different LLCs. So uh, pretty sophisticated. You really need to dive into this one. Our max loan size per the guidelines is $3 million. We did this loan at $3.4 million. Uh, we did the DTI at 48.8 using fully indexed, although this customer did take the IO option. And we were able to construe that income off all those sources. It was a big win for the borrower because they had a balloon payment due on this note. And on that size note, it was going to get pretty ugly for them in a hurry. Either they're going to lose that house quickly, which had a ton of equity. I think we were at 60 LTV or less on this loan. Uh, or they're going to hit with some pretty exorbitant fees when you think of a, a $3.4 million balance. So again, very happy borrower, very strong borrower. Um, we stepped up and made some exceptions and, and took a what I would consider a fairly sophisticated uh, file and, and made it work for them. So a little bit more in jumbos. As I said, our guidelines say we will go up to $3 million based on the product. We, as you just saw, we'll go a little higher sometimes. Um, we will do owner-occupied, second home, and investment properties, as you just saw. We do, again, have the interest-only payment options. We have a pretty strong interest-only payment um, program. We've got a few programs. One is a 40-year IO, so basically the first 10 years is interest-only, and then after that, automatically converts to a 30-year fixed. When you think of your, your, your true jumbo buyers, you know, the folks that have loan sizes above a million, million five, two million, they're often, again, very sophisticated folks financially. They might be partners in companies where they get a bonus at the end of the year. Uh, they might work in hedge funds or private equity, again, where they get bonuses at the end of the year. Those are the folks that really appreciate an IO payment because of not only how they're paid, but they have the financial discipline and wherewithal to, at year end when they get their bonus, probably make some kind of principal payment as well. So we see more and more of the folks with those higher loan sizes really opt in to the interest only piece. And again, it's, it's a pretty strong program. We do asset depletion where we, you know, we'll utilize assets over a 10 year draw. And then we also have something called the asset qualifier where we basically double that number. We can, we will use a five year draw period or 60 months off the qualifying assets. A couple of caveats around that program, such as loan amount is up to 75% of the assets. But your account executive can walk you through all of that and the difference between the two. I can tell you that having the extra um, ability on the qualifier certainly makes some loans. Lastly, we don't uh, discriminate on property types for jumbos. So it's single family, non workable condos, it's condo tells, it's one to four units. And again, if you saw some of the examples I just gave, um, I know that we approved a uh, high end residence above the Mandarin. Uh, in one of the major cities, it was a 75 LTV uh, purchase for a $1.8 million loan. You know, so non workable condo above a hotel, um, $1.8 million. So um, those were the five key groups. And just to kind of bring it full circle, you know, our programs are the Super Prime slash Alt A piece, uh, which is the real true fallout. We have our, what we call our expanded approval where you might have some other uh, caveats in there. Then you've got the expanded investor, which is really our DSCR product that I mentioned, where there's a no ratio loan in terms of income. You qualify off the subject properties uh, debt coverage ratio. And lastly, we touched on the foreign national piece. So again, some of the opportunities, how we can help you today grow your business and originate more loans. 
uh, cash out loans. It's no secret that the agency world has somewhat tightened up on cash out in the last two to four months. Uh, we do a lot of cash out for the right borrowers. Uh, our guidelines state up to $500,000 cash out. I've seen us do as high as a million five cash out. Or again, a solid borrower, strong LTV, had other reserves. It just made sense. We talked about non workable condos. We're very versed in those. We'll do condo tells, and we understand the difference between the two, whereas some of our competitors don't. Uh, larger acreage properties, we do plenty of those. Look for similar comps or look for some kind of mileage proximity to a decent employment base. Of course, we do multis. Second homes, not a problem. We touched on jumbos a fair amount, as well as DSCR, and you can mix the two if you like. Bank statement loans. Asset depletion, which again, can be used as the sole source of income or supplementary. Interest-only loans are available. Like I said, we've got a strong, strong 40-year IO. First 10 years, interest-only. Automatically converts to a 30-year fixed after that. And again, we will use a start rate on business purpose loans. Of course, we do the NP, uh, NPRAs, construction takeouts. We will still do the lease option to land contracts and treat them as refi, as long as they are, of course, recorded properly. We let properties be held in LLCs, which again, your investor community would like as you go after that business. And this is where one thing we're really unique at, and you can get some details from your account executive, but we will allow you to finance up to 2% LTV of, of your uh, lender or broker costs at ADLTV max. So what that means is, if you had an ADLTV loan on a borrower paid comp situation, the borrower would not have to bring those funds to the table. We could finance their comp into the loan. It would not affect your LTV bucket, nor would it affect your pricing bucket. What it really would affect is your borrower, because they're gonna bring a heck of a lot less money to the closing, which I'm assuming would make them pretty happy. So again, your, your account executive can walk you through those. I'm gonna pass it back to Rose now. We should talk about some of our private label resources to help you go after this business. We have, we talked about five segments. We gave you some avenues. Now here's some tools where you can put your name and your company on these, on these, these pieces and get them out to those groups. So I'll, I'll flip it back to you, Rose. Thank you, Jamie. So as Jamie mentioned, we've assembled a great uh, collection of private label resources that you can customize. You can put in your logo, your contact info, your disclaimers, and we've got PDF flyers, Outlook emails, posters, social media banners, and it's all available for you uh, for free. The, the URL to download is above, and uh, if you need any help with this, just contact your Lensure account executive. They are happy to help you customize these so that you can start growing your business today. Yeah, I, I can't stress enough how, how much we will partner with you in these efforts. Um, you know, we talk about these resources, which are great. Uh, we present often to realtor offices with our loan officer partners. So they will bring us on in as the non-QM expert to their realtors, and, and we will present these programs. And it, it creates a nice bond for, for the LO and those realtors. So we're, we're happy to help you in your efforts, go after this business and, and explore new things. And, and we can do some of those presentations and marketing with you. One last, couple last things, how to do business with us. We mentioned the pre-qual system up front. We're glad to give you a, a pretty firm answer so you know what you have. Once you've sold a deal to your customer and have the package, we submit it, we disclose it, we underwrite it, put it to CD, close and fund, just like any other loan. Uh, it is non-QM, so there, you know, there might be a couple different documents. We're not gonna take an AUS, but it's, I mean, it's not rocket science. If you give us a full story and a qualified borrower, We'll take you through these steps and we'll close your loan. Uh, here's an online source for you where you have a scenario form you could submit. You could submit it to a variety of resources. You can go right to our webpage and see this as well. So you might, a week from now, come across a live lead, a scenario. It might be the weekend, whatever the case is. You might have a fallout. You might have a denial from Fannie. And you might, the light bulb might go off in this webinar. Please feel free. Fill out the form, send it in. We'll get back to you very quickly. And at that time, I'd first like to thank you all for, for participating. And now I'd like to open up the questions and answers. Again, we do have our director of underwriting on the line, and we're glad to answer anything we can for you today. 
Thank you, Jamie. So go ahead and use the little uh, questions tab. Submit any questions. Don't be shy. We're happy to help. As Jamie mentioned, we also have Steve Moloff, our Director of Underwriting, and Todd Harris, our Director, National Sales Director, um, available. Jamie, if you could leave that slide on there, that would be great. Um, so question, what rate um, on that our scenario with our truck driver, what rate did we end up closing that loan for? I'd have to look, um, but I can tell you that right now our rates are anywhere in the fours up to the generally mid to high sixes. Uh, that was an owner-occupied purchase. Uh, so my guess is that person was somewhere in the um, high fours to low fives. Awesome. And then can we can you guys use personal as well as business, sta uh, business uh, bank statements for self-employed? I, I can tie, uh, once again, thank you, Rose. Thank you, Jamie. This is Steve Moloff. Uh, we do use a combination. So we do things a little bit differently, and your your account manager can walk you through it. We don't have a standard expense factor that Jamie was talking to you about. We use the self-employed questionnaire to try to come up with an idea of what the expenses are for the business. So typically, with personal bank statements, if you're u using those strictly on their own, I'm a self-employed accountant, I don't really have a business account, I do bookkeeping at home, then if it's from home, there's no expenses, all the business goes through the personal, then we'll use a 10% expense factor, so we can do that. Or if it's someone that you have a bigger company where you have 50 employees, then what we'll do is we'll get three months of business bank statements, and then we'll compare that to the 12 or 24 months personal bank statements, and as long as the business is got, having revenues that generate the same amount or you know or more with the expenses that goes into the personal account, we basically don't use an expense factor on the personal account and give them 100% of those expenses relate or of the income related to that business. And we can do uh, the same bank statements on strictly business as well. Uh, so it really depends on how the, the borrower runs the business. We look at it as not a one size fits all. We really want to have an understanding how that individual is operating his business. We try to work to come up with uh, the income that uh, we believe that he makes and hopefully he qualifies when we move down the road. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. And what are our turn times? Well, I can talk a little bit about that. You have uh, turn times. There's a couple questions, and since I handle operations as well, I can give you both. So if you're looking just for a free qual, you want to find out what the rate is. Uh, if it's a very simple one, you're just asking for LTV and rate, uh, you can ask your account executive for that. He can give you that fairly quickly. If you're saying, ah, you know, I want to know whether or not you're going to be able to get the income out of these bank statements. We have operational teams where you can send in your 24 or 12-month bank statements. And we'll come back and say, hey, this is an income number we think we can use based on the LTV you're, re you're requesting. We can give you the pricing based on that. And those usually take, depending on how complex the, the statements are, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, once we get the complete file and the conditions where it's ready to go into underwriting, uh, currently that's still running right now around 24 to 48 hours. So uh, we're actually doing pretty well with that post-COVID. We've hired a lot of people uh, in the company. And uh, I, I don't think you'll, based on what we're seeing on conforming right now, I think everybody's biggest problem is getting the appraisals back because uh, they're, they all tend to be swamped. So um, that's generally our standard. Awesome. Do we have a program for a borrower who is self-employed for less than one year but has been in the same line of work for over five years? So the income is the same. They just went from a W-2 to a 1099. Yeah, you know, that question comes up all the time, and a lot of times they even work for the same company. I think I actually approved two of those uh, within the last week, and what we normally do is we take, okay, well, the W-2s, I was making 100000 and now I'm uh, a 1099 person, but I'm basically doing the exact same job, except the company just switched me over to that, and now I'm making 110000 and I got a 10% expense factor, so I really am back making the similar income to what I was doing before. Uh, that, that's not a problem. We see it all the time. Okay, great. What's our LTV, the max on investment properties? Uh, that changes by the, what type of transaction you're going to do. So right now on an investor, 
Uh, our top LTV on a purchase is 80. A rate and term, we're at 70. Cash out, we're at 60. But it really depends on the deal. Uh, once again, we make our, our business is really uh, an exception driven business. It's probably 35% at least of our deals have some kind of deviation to our guidelines. So we're really looking at the compensating factors, you know, uh, for investor properties. It really depends, you know, how long is he on the property? What What is the income type? Um, if he's doing a purchase, is it their funds that they're using for the down payment? So all these deals, um, from our point of view, kind of stand on their own merit. So we make deviations on LTVs all the time too, but the highest standard would be 80 on purchase for an investor. Okay. Uh, where do we do business, in all 50 states? Currently, in well, two states. <laughs> yeah, right. I was going to say almost. Yeah, it's we're we're 42 states, and and you can see that on our web page under the licensing tab. Um, one exception would be New York, where we cannot do owner-occupied properties, but we can offer our full suite of investment property options. Okay, and I'm getting several questions about wanting the link to the private label resources and are we going to get a copy of the slides, etc. So, yes, after the webinar, we're going to send you a thank you email and we'll all include a link to the private label resources and I'll include a link, a PDF of the slide deck as well as the recording so that you can share it with your colleagues. So, look for that within the next about 24 hours. Okay, and... Uh, when we have a bank statement loan, do you want us to submit it or do you want to go over the bank statements first? Well, that's uh, that's one of the things that the nice thing is about our front end operations process before it goes actually into underwriting is we can take a look at those bank statements for you on our team. Once again, once your account executive can direct you to his operational team. And you can set the bank statements in, give us a general idea of what you're trying to do, purchase re rate and term, you know, cash out, um, owner, occupied, non-owner, whatever the product is you're trying to do. And then we can uh, take a look at those bank statements for you and probably give you a pretty quick, uh, a quick call back and kind of steer you how we think this is going to look or um, if we need to have personal or just have an understanding of what the business is. Also, we, we do have a, a FCQ form, as we call it, the self-employment questionnaire which really is just a two-page one. It kind of replaces what a P&L is, and it just gives you a chance to ask some bar. Here's some questions. This is, here's how I operate my business. So it's a pretty easy process. Um, contact your account executive and get your bank statements together and get them in, and we'll tell you what we can do with them. Okay. And uh, Stephen wants to know about transferred appraisal. If a bar went to another bank, could we use their appraisal? Yeah, that comes up all the time. Uh, we do take other lenders' appraisals. We generally like to see them ordered through an AMC, so we will look through for that. It's not necessarily an automatic no, but uh, everybody out there is generally using their own AMCs. We do have a list of, I think, 10 approved on our website, but we will take uh, other appraisals that are in the name of other lenders, so that's true. Okay. A related question. Is it possible to waive an appraisal requirement on deals if they qualify? Uh, can't can't waive the appraisal requirements. Uh, what we do is we generally have on each deal, the standard is an appraisal, and then we do a desk review. So the, the appraisal process is actually smooth, but currently all, all appraisals, uh, for the most part in the market out there, for you guys that maybe follow some of the securitizations that they pretty much require two valuation models for each loan to be securitized. So we kind of follow that rule, but thank you. Okay. Um, what's the price, the highest LTV we go on owner occupied? Uh, currently we are at 85% today, as of today. Okay. And Dean wants to know about any property uh, restrictions such as mixed use, et cetera. Uh, the mixed use ones, uh, we have done mixed use in the past. We have we've done some too since we've been back. Uh, mixed use really depends on the collateral. Um, so the, obviously, there's a lot of things involved with that. Is it a house that's converted that's being used for a hair salon, or is it a multi-story where you've got you know three apartments above and on the bottom floor, it's a uh, you know a jazz or exercise studio. Uh, so 
it depends on the collateral there. We will look at them, um, but they're done on exception. Okay, here's an interesting one. If we have a self-employed borrower that stopped working due to COVID, how long would they have to be working again in the same business? Uh, that's an interesting question and a good one, and it comes up all the time. Uh, we do have some COVID overlays currently in our guidelines. What we're really looking for, and when, when I hear someone say it's a self-employed borrower, my first question is, okay, I don't know if we have full doc in the past or trying to do all bank statements. So most of the business owners may have had one month where they had to shut down and there was actually nothing in some states where they like closed a restaurant completely and they weren't really set up to do pickup business at that point. But now the, the, the real COVID events that we've seen, the impact really happened in April, May, and June. Now we've had two more months since then. So what we're really looking to see is understanding twofold. Number one, obviously, is the business back running? Is it running at what capacity? How close is it to the revenues prior to the COVID event? Or has he changed his business model where he's actually reduced a bunch of ex his expenses, i.e. a restaurant? I can't do in-house in, uh, dining now, but I've changed my model, and now I'm doing a lot more delivery and takeout. So... We really want to, see, you can't have currently no activity on your business. The business has to be back and running. And we really look at the most recent bank statements specifically now, July and August, to really see, okay, have the revenues kind of come back to close to where he was uh, prior to COVID? And, you know, what's the borrower's game plan? Has the business changed? So we just ask some questions, try to get comfortable with it. Okay, and I've got several questions that have very specific loan uh, scenario questions. So what I'd like to do with those is I'll contact you after the webinar to have a, um, an account manager or an account executive uh, work with you on those specifics because I want to make sure that we get you as complete and accurate information as we possibly can. Is this webinar available for replay? Yes, it is available for replay. How would I submit a deal? There's a couple uh, to Lensure. There's a couple ways to do it. You can go to our website and go to under broker resources. There's submit your scenario where you can put in all the details and I personally, Rose, get those emails and I send them out immediately and get somebody to contact you as soon as possible. So feel free to do that. Also, you can just uh, go ahead and reply to the thank you email that I'm going to be sending you and I will uh, work with you to get your uh, scenarios to the right people and get them started right away. What about student loans on deferral? In general, how do we handle those? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, there's a two-fold piece on that right now. Pretty much the government came out and took everybody's government back student loan and said, hey, you're deferred through September. So we don't know how they're going to react. The other one, the standard policy is if it says deferred on the credit bureau report, we don't have to attach a payment in it for debt ratio purposes. If it doesn't say deferred and there's no payment, then we use a 1% in order to calculate the debt ratio. Okay. And then how do we handle um, variable tipped employees that were furloughed? Can you ignore the time off due to COVID uh, when determining income? Uh, that's another good question. I just looked at one, I can't remember, was this week or last week. In this particular case, we had a long-term bartender slash guy worked in a, a business in Arizona. He, he'd been there like 20 some years. He got a salary and that was paid to him obviously in wages and he claimed some of his tips. And the other tips, he had personal bank statements where you could actually see the deposits going into personal bank statements. In this particular case, the restaurant was closed for approximately a month since it's reopened, since now they have some sidewalk dining and this kind of stuff where you can still social distance. And we've had two of his, this one, like I said, this was just, I think earlier this week or last week, where the last two months deposits were similar to back, so the August and July deposits were similar to what he had prior to COVID. So what we're doing is since the last two months still qualify him based on he doesn't really have any expenses, that's what alone we're, we're moving along on and that's a purchase money deal and it's his money. And so in that particular case, it wasn't an issue. We could write to the story and it made sense. So it really depends on what the bank statements look like and if he, the person is back and operating and getting the income 
at a certain at a level that they need to qualify. Okay, great. And with that, if any other questions come up, please go ahead and um, you can contact contact us through the Lencher website, or you can reply to uh, the thank you email that you will be getting shortly. Um, Steve, do you have any closing comments? I appreciate everybody's time today. I know uh, I, I did listen through the whole call, and I, uh, Jamie, uh, I think, did a great job, Rose, yourself, too. Um, we're definitely here to help you and assist with uh, uh, getting through this pandemic and continuing to grow your business. So let us know what we can do for you. Give us a call, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Hope everybody's safe and healthy out there. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And by the way, thank you, everyone, for uh, for submitting the thank yous and the kudos. I really appreciate it. Jamie, any closing comments? No, I, I would echo what Steve said. Appreciate everybody's time. Stay safe. Um, can't stress enough how willing we are to partner with you to help you grow your business. Again, whether that's realtor presentations, marketing resources, um, you know, saving that refi that fell out for some agency wrinkle. Uh, we're here to help. We, we're looking for good partners and, and we, we'd love to help you in any way you, you feel you need. So just reach out. If you don't know who your account executive is, reach out and we'll hook you up with them. Thanks again. All right. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today.